So here's a great tip on how to start a revolution. Take your biggest supporter, the one guy who has supported you when no one else would, who happens to be the most famous American on the planet, and find a way to piss him off. This is the story of how Great Britain started a revolution, how they managed to anger the colonists so much that they went from fighting for the British to fighting against them just 10 years later. So the story begins in 1754, when George Washington marches into the Ohio country and he stumbles upon some sleeping French soldiers and starts a massive world war, which is called the French and Indian War. Uh, early on in that war, things are not going well for the British, and that's when Benjamin Franklin springs to action. Now, Benjamin Franklin is not your ideal soldier, right? He's rich, he's famous, he's 50 years old, he's unathletic, he is not made for the battlefield. But the governor of Pennsylvania makes Benjamin Franklin a military commander, and off he goes into this dangerous Ohio country to build forts and advance the British cause, which is absolutely crazy. Uh, by 1763, the war is over, and the British have won, and Benjamin Franklin has set sail to London, where he will live for the next 10 years or so. And this is when things are, are going to start to get really interesting, um, because wars are expensive, and this case was no exception. So Great Britain ended, ended this war with 137 million pounds of debt. Now, just to give you some perspective, um, the government every year had to spend more than half of its entire budget just paying for the interest on that debt. So Great Britain has a massive debt problem and they decide, you know what, we're going to start collecting some of this cash from the colonies, right? So they pass what's called the Sugar Act. Now, the Sugar Act is a tax on a whole bunch of stuff being shipped into the colonies from non-British places. We're talking about sugar, wine, coffee, a whole bunch of stuff. Now, this idea isn't really new. In fact, a lot of these taxes have been around for 20 or 30 years, including the tax on sugar. And the sugar act actually reduces some of these taxes. In the case of sugar, the sugar, act redu the sugar act reduces the taxes from six pence per gallon to three pence per gallon. So it cuts it in half. Now, here's the issue. The issue is that in the past, uh, Great Britain didn't really enforce the, uh, these taxes. And so people are just constantly like smuggling things into the colonies. And now with the Sugar Act, uh, you know, things are different. Great Britain needs the money. And so they plan to start enforcing the taxes. Uh, Benjamin Franklin thinks this is fine, right? He says these taxes are fair, they're modest, they're reasonable. And you know what? If this is what needs to be done to pay for the war and to pay for all the British soldiers who now have to stay in the colonies to protect it, he's fine with it, not a big deal. Now, there are some people in the colonies who are really upset by the Sugar Act, but for the most part, you know, people are, are, are just kind of okay with it. They let it go. They let it go. After all, they're not the ones paying the tax. The problem is that the Sugar Act doesn't generate enough money and the British need more cash. So the next year, they call Ben Franklin, right, who's in London, and they say, hey, Ben, we've got this idea for this other tax that, that we're calling the Stamp Act. And here's how it works. We're just going to tax anything made of paper, right? Newspapers, pamphlets, uh, diplomas, marriage certificates, legal documents, playing cards, anything made of paper, okay? The colonists will pay the tax, and then, you know, we'll put like this little stamp on the paper just to confirm they paid it, like a, like a receipt. And if they don't want to pay the tax, that's fine. We'll just ship them off to Nova Scotia for a trial without a jury. So what do you think? And Ben Franklin, remember, he, he owns a whole bunch of newspapers in the colony. So he doesn't really love the idea of taxing paper, right? It's going to crush his business. So he tells them, well, you know, maybe you can consider taxing some other things instead of paper. Uh, but in the end, the parliament goes ahead with the Stamp Act and they approve it anyway. So, you know, Franklin isn't that upset once the Stamp Act passes. He actually goes out and he gets a job for his buddy, John Hughes, who's the Speaker of the Pennsylvania Assembly, uh, as the number one collector of the stamp tax in Pennsylvania, which is pretty cool because John's going to get a little cut of all the taxes that he collects. So Franklin is happy. Uh, John Hughes is happy. 
But back in the colonies, nobody is happy. They hate the Stamp Act. They refuse to pay it. And they refuse to pay it because they say, look, the British Parliament, okay, has no right to tax us. We don't have any representatives in the British government. They can't tax us. No taxation without representation, right? So they get very angry. In some cases, they destroy the homes of British officials and stamp tax collectors. And John Hughes kind of freaks out. And he writes this letter to Franklin where he says, hey, man, things are getting crazy here. People don't want to pay the stamp act and they are getting violent. He says, I fancy some lives will be lost before this fire is put out. And he tells Franklin that he's going to arm himself and protect his home at the risk of my life. So Franklin writes back and he says, hey, John, buddy, stay calm. Don't worry about it. He says, listen, this whole stamp tax thing, it's going to make you unpopular for a little while, but people will come around to it. They will pay the tax. They will accept the tax. And in the meantime, he says, just stay the course. He says a firm loyalty to the crown will always be the wisest course for you and I to take. Well, back in the colonies, people didn't really agree with Franklin. They refused to pay the Stamp Act. And, and, and in some cases, they started blaming Benjamin Franklin for the Stamp Act. So an angry mob actually gets together and, and starts marching down uh, to Franklin's house to burn the thing down, destroy the thing. And uh, Franklin is lucky. He has some very good friends who confront the mob and kind of shoo them away and protect his house. But Franklin's buddy and his business partner writes him a letter saying, hey, things are very, very bad down here. He says, I should be afraid for your safety. And so Franklin finally gets it. He understands, look, the colonists will not pay this stamp tax. And he goes marching into parliament and he convinces them to repeal it. He says, look, guys, the colonists, they are never, ever going to pay your stamp act. OK, so get rid of it. But he also tells them they don't really have a problem okay, paying taxes on imported goods. He says, I have never heard any objection to this kind of tax. He says, the sea is yours. You keep it clear of pirates. And if you want to tax some goods that are passing through that sea that you are protecting, that's fine. Nobody's going to bother you. So the parliament gets rid of the Stamp Act, but they pass what's called the Townshand Duties. The Townshand Duties are taxes on a bunch of goods being imported to the colonies. Paper, glass, paint, tea. Franklin, of course, is okay with it, right? He's okay with it. He writes to a friend actually saying that his king and queen were the very best in the world. Well, in the colonies, people didn't really feel the same way. Uh, they refused to pay these taxes too, right? At this point, again, they're saying, we don't have representatives in parliament. Who are they to be taxing us? Right. So in Boston, a bunch of angry colonists march down to the local custom house where these towns and duties are paid and they start throwing things at the British officials and the soldiers protecting it. Soldiers open fire and five colonists are killed. This is what's called the Boston Massacre. And colonists are absolutely furious. They're outraged. Even Benjamin Franklin calls these uh, British soldiers detestable murderers. So British Parliament realizes, okay, they've got to do something to sort of calm things down, to bring the temperature down. And so they get rid of the town's head duties. They repeal all the taxes, except for one. They keep one tax in place because they want to remind the colonists, hey, listen, we're going to repeal all these taxes, but if we want to tax you, we can. We have that right. And so they leave in place the tax on tea. And it turns out that's not enough. Back in Boston, a group of angry colonists, about 100, march toward the, uh, the port of Boston. They sneak onto a ship and they spend three hours dumping tea into the ocean. This, of course, is what's called the Boston Tea Party. And when word gets back to London that the colonists have destroyed what would be today millions of dollars in tea, uh, the British Parliament goes nuts. And they decide they need to punish the colonists, right? Now, Benjamin Franklin jumps in and he tries desperately to, to save the day, right? He even offers to pay for the tea himself if the British will sort of take it easy on the colonies. But by this point, the British, they're not really listening to Benjamin Franklin anymore. In fact, 
Some of them are calling him a traitor and some of them are blaming him for the Boston Tea Party. Why? Well, because a year earlier, uh, Benjamin Franklin had actually, he got hold of some really sensitive British documents and he leaked them to some friends of his in the colonies. And when all these documents got out in the colonies, it made the British look really, really bad and it made the colonists really, really angry. And so, you know, at this point, some people are calling Franklin a traitor. They don't want to listen to him. They ignore him and they pass what comes to be known as the Intolerable Acts or the Coercive Acts. Now, these laws do a few different things. Number one, they shut down the Port of Boston. Uh, number two, they say that uh, colonists in Massachusetts have to pay for all the tea that was thrown overboard. Number three, colonists in Massachusetts can no longer elect their leaders in colonial government. And number four says that, co that colonists anywhere have to allow British soldiers to basically take over unoccupied homes, buildings, structures, right? Um, the colonists decide this is absolutely not acceptable uh, and they need to have a unified response to the British crown. So they call a meeting uh, that's called the First Continental Congress to figure out how to respond. 12 of the 13 colonies send representatives, Georgia is the one colony that says they don't want to participate. They want to stay loyal to Great Britain. So 12 colonies participate. And after days and days of debate, they decide that uh, they're just going to send a very nice, gently worded letter to King George asking him, please, please, please uh, take away these intolerable acts. So that letter goes out. King George receives it and he throws it in the trash. The following year is 1775. Benjamin Franklin hops on a ship and he sails back to the colonies. He is angry with the British. He is determined to fight. He is insistent that the colonies have to fight for their independence and things are about to get really, really heated. But we'll talk about that in the next video.